Hi, everyone. We have with us today Eric Winsberg, a professor of philosophy from the University of South Florida. And he joins us again after a couple of weeks uh, after talking to us about um, models during the pandemic. And we wanted to hear more from him. So here's back joining us at Policy McCombs. Eric, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Great. So you're a professor of philosophy. You study philosophy of science. Um, can you give us a big picture uh, a description of your, of your research agenda? Um, I mean, I work on a, a bunch of different stuff. I sort of, you know, started my career. Um, I was interested in computer simulation just because that was sort of a thing that people hadn't really talked about much in philosophy of science. Um, I, I worked on that for a while. And I think, you know, by around, uh, I got my PhD in 99, by around 2008, sort of became obvious that, you know, I should start thinking about um, the use of computer simulation and climate science. I uh, started learning a little bit more about climate science. Um, um, I'm, I'm interested in lots of different features of that. I'm interested in sort of like, you know, what what modeling is, what its goals are, what what makes, you know, what makes uh, good modeling, what are some like features of modeling that make it different from other kinds of scientific tools. Um, I'm interested in uh, the role that um, you know, values play in science. That's sort of what you know that what we care about. You know, when when we're when we're investigating a question like the you know the future of the Earth's climate, what role does do what we believe about you know the the relative value of the harms that we're trying to mitigate there versus you know um, maybe possibly the the benefits of the things that we're we'd have to give up in order to 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 pay for that mitigation. Um, I'm also sort of, I've gotten a little bit more interested in, um, you know, how science guides policy, um, but I'm not, I'm, I'm not a political scientist and I'm not, um, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm just getting my feet wet at that. I don't, you know, I don't really pretend to understand that stuff super well, but yeah. so, yeah. That's great. We, we care a lot about, I, I do a lot of work on decision-making under uncertainty and I teach a lot around, around that area. And, uh, uh one of the things that since the Salem Center where we're speaking right now is is very interested in is the idea of how we use evidence to make decisions in the public policy space. And it's just not when you say this, it sounds pretty cool, right? Oh, yeah, using evidence to make decisions, you know, it seems like straightforward. And, and it's sure. not right. And, yeah. and it's permeated a lot by values in ways that uh, uh, is often hard to even acknowledge. So you know, you see here behind me, I guess, Milton Friedman. So, you know, you might already have some indication of my biases that I bring to the table when I'm thinking right. about evaluating a policy. And so one of the things that I've been doing in the past few years that I, I, I find very re uh, rewarding is that I teach a class with a philosopher where we, we talk about values and evidence and economics and decision making. And it's something that's new to me and I'm trying to sort of wrap my head around uh, and I was super interested in your take on this, especially focusing on on computer models, which is such a is a specific tool for scientific inquiry uh, that is widely used in, in climate science and was big during the pandemic as well. So sure. let's start there and 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 talk about um, your general view on the difference between the the, the sort of computer models, and simulation models, and how they 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 play a role in disease modeling that we saw in the past two years relative to their role in climate science? Yeah, so, I mean, there, there are probably a lot of differences. We'll talk about a few of them. I mean, one obvious difference is that climate modeling is at least partially grounded in physical science. Whereas, you know, disease modeling, you might think is grounded in, in our knowledge of diseases, but it really isn't. I mean, disease modeling is really grounded just in assumptions about, um, about human behavior. Uh, so if you think, if you look at, you know, things like the Imperial College model uh, uh, that, you know, came out in, in March 2020, I mean, most of the, most, most of the assumptions about it were just about how human contacts would occur. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's really missing insofar as it should have had some, you know, input with regard to like, it, you know, is the virus maybe seasonal or does it, you know, move through animal reservoirs or, you know, is there, is, are there reasons why, you know, we sort of see like, you know, um, let's say in the US, we saw like spikes in the summer in, you know, Texas and Florida or, or where we live and then, you know, more in the winter and spring in the North, whatever. There's just not, there wasn't a lot of that in there. So, so then a lot of that modeling just was based on making assumptions about, um, about, you know, what, what different, what different um, rules that you might impose 
would do uh, to human contacts. So I think people like to remind people that you know the the, the deem and epidemiology is like the deem of demos. It's like it's about people. Uh, so it, so that's one difference. Um, another difference is that like um, I guess well it's not an intrinsic difference between them, but it's a difference between how we've seen them play out. Um, you know, a lot of the epidemiological modeling was like was just happening in real time. Um, it was often like somebody would, you know, would make a model and they'd, they'd give one result and they'd say like, this is what the model shows. Whereas, you know, climate modeling has been going on for 30, 40 years. There's huge ensembles of models. Um, and so far as the models like have parameter values, climate modelers like are, have spent quite a bit more time exploring the different possible parameters to look at what, like, what happens across parameter space, what's robust in that. Um, and then um, maybe a third difference um, is that uh, is that climate models, you know, are, are trying to. So both, I think both both climate models and epidemiological models are trying to do what um, I think one ought to sort of carefully call projection as opposed to prediction. So prediction is like you use a model to tell you what's going to happen. Projection you tell you use a model to tell you what will happen under different scenarios. Uh, so it's, that's, you know, projection models are, are the sort of policy relevant things par excellence, right? But um, the kind of kind of epidemiological models, at least in the, in the, in the last two years, tried to butt right up against policy choices directly. So like inputs to like the Imperial College model were really like literally policy decisions, close schools, uh, go, you know, require social distancing, require inessential businesses to close. Whereas, whereas climate models don't do that. We don't we don't put like um, we don't put like carbon taxes or you know credits on electric cars into climate models. We put just you know greenhouse gas concentrations or concentration pathways, um, which at least there we kind of you know have a grip on. Um, you know what the levels are now. And you know what the levels just... are. You know you know you know you know you can you know you kind of you you, you kind of know that that's not it's like it's it's not really in doubt that that's a main main causal variable. Whereas like somebody might really, and a lot of people do doubt, for example, that like closing schools um, is a is a really good causal variable in epidemics because you might worry that like we well, close schools, the kids are going to meet elsewhere. Anyway, right, right. Whereas like you know, we know carbon dioxide is a heat trapping gas. Like that's not really debatable. Um, and then you kind of then you know if you're if you're a climate scientist, you're kind of then leaving it up to other people to ask the question. Okay, let's say we decide that you know it's you know we're 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 on a dangerous course as far as our emissions are concerned. Um, you know, you'll hear climate you'll hear climate scientists give their opinions about this, but it's not part of their scientific practice, I don't think, to tell us, oh, you should have this much carbon tax, or you should you know put credits on electric cars, or you should enter into this treaty, or um, or at least you know, insofar as they do do that. Um, I think it's easier uh, as consumers for us to separate that from their actual scientific findings and just say, okay, you're, you know, you're reasonably well informed about the climate science, but your policy recommendations are, you know, okay, th th you're not, th that's not fully engaged with your expertise. We can take that, we can sort of maybe take that or leave it in a slightly greater way than we might with regard to what they say, you know, about the connection between say greenhouse gas concentrations and, and then what might happen to the climate. So, so just to, to clarify that when the, um, the most, the majority of climate science, the, the climate models will take into account uh, as a scenario is basically, okay, how much CO2 we're going to be pumping into the atmosphere in the next, say, 100 years right. we'll through the system. There's a lot of complicated things that happen as a result of that. And you can say, okay, well, this might be the outcome. And they have parameters they can do sensitivity for. And you see the different models and can make assembles of models. But nobody's trying to say, all right, if I put a carbon tax, right. here's right. the path of carbon emissions in the next 100 years. Or at least that's, you know, there may be models that do that. They're not, you know, those are often like collaborations between climate scientists and, economic, uh, and, and economists. They're not really mainstream climate science. Um, there's certainly like, if you read, uh, you know, working group one uh, assessment reports in the IPCC, which is kind of, that's the, that's the, that's the you know, that's the working group. That's my bread and butter. You won't you won't find stuff like that. That's not their that's not their um, that's not their their purview. So so okay. So when you, when we're looking at the decision making that took place in the beginning, March twenty twenty, right? So you mm -hmm. start seeing those models, and you start seeing the fact that they were taking into account as assumptions human behavior. You're saying, well, if we close schools, 
then the virus is going to do this. If we do that, the virus. And they were very much targeted into telling us what to do. So, what was your reaction, and what was your sort of like? Um, I guess, I guess, what maybe the, the answer, the question is a little bit different. The question is, how do you think those models should have been used by the decision makers? What would they yeah. at that point in time? I mean, but there's not a number of things we could say. I think first of all, people I think probably ought to have been a little bit more forthcoming about the fact that I think you know, in retrospect, what everybody always tells me now. They say, oh, okay, Eric, sure, the models were, you know, pretty epistemically shaky or whatever, but, you know, we were in an emergency and, um, you know, people had to be, people had to act with an abundance of caution. And um, I think that ought to have been, that's fine, you know, I mean, that's fine. I think that's, you know, that's always, it's, it's always open to policymakers, I think, to say, um, we don't have good information. Um, so we have kind of, we have, uh, there's a paper I wrote with, with Stephanie Harbour, but we call this duty analysis, right? We say you do this when cost benefit analysis just isn't available because you don't think you have good enough information. You do duty analysis, you say, look, I mean, you know, the public presumably um, thinks that our number one responsibility, maybe you say this, right? You could say this, but I'm not, I'm not saying you have to say this, but it's the thing you could say, right? The public has, you know, thinks our number one responsibility is to save lives from, you know, a potentially like horrific disease, and so we're not doing cost benefit analysis. We're just going to be, we're just going to be acting on that perception of what our duty is, um, and we're going to wait for better information before we move to a cost benefit analysis. But then, when you're doing that, right, you shouldn't even be, you shouldn't even be mentioning models, right? You shouldn't be, you shouldn't be um, saying that you're following the science. You shouldn't be. You know, claiming that your your activities are guided by those models. Um, so, you know, one thing I think is the policymaker should always be honest. I think about what 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 the inputs their decision making is. And you know, I, I mean, I don't know if you agree with this or not. I'm not sure how I feel about this all the time, but I do think there are going to be situations when policymakers are going to be in an information vacuum. And you know, we have to we have to understand that, and we have to understand that when that happens. They're gonna have to. They're gonna have to do something different than cost benefit analysis. And you know, we could have re, we could have we could have a debate about whether you know protecting liberties, protecting you know economic flourishing, or you know saving lives from disease. Which of those are the more profound duty? When you can't, when you're not ready to like say, okay, there's gonna be this much of that and this much of that. We could have that debate. But 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 I don't think we ought to be having the debate about whether people should be honest about that. that that's I think the first thing. They should be honest. So then the second thing is like, well, okay, well that, you know, so presumably you want to do that for as short a period of time as possible, right? You want, if you're going to act that way, you want to as quickly as possible move to a, to a cost benefit analysis. And you can't really do cost benefit analysis, um, you know, in, a, in an evolving situation, either like climate science or epidemiology, right? You, uh, or, or, you know, disease spread, you can't do cost benefit analysis without some kind of tool that makes projections for you, right? Because cost benefit analysis is I have these courses of actions I could take, and I want to know what's the probability of each of those producing various goods and harms. You can't do that, it seems to me, in situations like that without a model. Okay. Um, but you also, I think, then need to say, like, well, okay, these models are it's not easy, right? It's not easy to model a novel pandemic. It's not easy when we've never um, never done any, you know, the kinds of interventions we did in the last two years, we've never really done them in a modern society. We've certainly never measured, you know, what their, what their outcomes are and stuff like that. So there are a lot of really unknown inputs to models like that. And um, there needs to be, I think, more, you know, I, I think we did a poor job of kind of exploring the sensitivity of those models to the values of those inputs um, and being sort of honest about, you know, where they came from. So uh, I was just talking to, um, just talking to somebody yesterday about this, about, you know, um, he sort of emailed Neil Ferguson about the, the value that they used for the reduced contact rate when children don't go to school. And he sort of, you know, just was always oh, so I followed all these footnotes. You follow this footnote to that footnote to that footnote. And finally, like six footnotes deep, you find out not they, there's just a footnote that says like, we didn't know, we just made up a number. Um, okay. I mean, you know, sometimes you have to do that when you, when you, if you, if you want to move to cost benefit analysis, you're going to need a model. 
you're going to need um, you're going to need value for that number. You can't figure out whether or not you should close schools or not without having a sense of what the reduced contact rate is when you close schools. But um, you ought to be doing some hard work. Um, first of all, you know, like making that reasoning public. I shouldn't have to follow six footnotes to find that. Um, you should be um, exploring what happens when you use different values that are consistent with what you know, right? If, if, if you really know very little about that, then almost any value might be consistent with, you know, you gotta be looking at all of that. Um, and you ought to be thinking hard, again, since the game is gonna be cost benefit and then analysis in the end, and, and that's presumably, you know, utility maximization that needs probabilities, you should be trying to think about, you know, what your ignorance about those parameter values tells you about what kind of uncertainty envelope to put on, to put on your projections. So, um, you know, um, as far as like things I would have liked to have seen gone differently, um, I would have liked to have seen very early on candor about that there was something more like what I would call duty analysis than cost benefit analysis. Duty analysis is not guided by science at all, right? Um, I would have liked to have seen their part of the advantage of, of being candid about that is that then you can then you can be honest about when you're transitioning, right? If you're honest that you're doing duty analysis at the beginning, you can then be honest and say, okay, now you know it's 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 a month in. Nobody can really say closing schools is no big deal anymore, right? Now it's, it's going to be, or you know, certainly by like it's September 2020, and we've missed the whole you know last quarter of the school year. It's just going to be a new school year. Um, you move to, you can move to a custom analysis and now, right now you ought to be, um, more public with your models, more transparent with them, um, slower and careful, more careful, uh, do sensitivity analysis, be, you know, sort of like candid about what your uncertainties are, how you're estimating those uncertainties, things like that. I, and I think like, you know, certainly, I've, certainly it's the case that climate science isn't perfect at all those things, but I do think like it's better. I think it's been, you know, I think we, we, we have learned to expect more from that than we, than we got with the, with the kind of the case. So the, the you know, I, I don't expect humility and candor from politicians. I mean, that's, that's a hard thing to expect. And, and, and yeah. it's, not a, it's not an American thing. It's not, you know, Texas or Florida. It's just like a generic problem with, with politicians throughout sure. the democratic system, right? It's very rare. Those exceptions, the ones that have the candor and the ability to keep their votes and so on. Um, but I do expect humility from, from, from academics, from professors, from researchers. I think that's the, to me, and I don't want to, you know, put words in your mouth, but the thing to me, the biggest failure, one of the biggest failure of the pandemic has been our profession, not being candor, not being honest, not being you know, <laughs> humble about what we know, yeah. what we know in the beginning. And that's why, you know, the fall of science thing became such a, such a strong, and I mean, I, I love your point of when you say that if you had humility, when you're trying to change, it would be a lot easier to even get people to go along and say, listen, let's try this because we don't know. As opposed right. to like, no, that's what the science says. That's what this person here told me right. through the graph here. I have a graph for you. And, and, and then once, once people repeatedly see that, wait a second, those graphs didn't pan out. The things that they told us didn't work the way they told us. So you start getting this like, you know, distrust of the institution and the distrust grows and distrust grows. And, and yeah, now, are you surprised that some people become hesitant to take a vaccine or, you know, right. this trust is really big. And I right. think a lot of it, it comes from, from our profession and, it, and that's pretty, pretty sad. Uh, um, anyway, that's that, that. Yeah. I mean, there's two ways to look at it, right? There are two ways to look at it. And, and I've uh, maybe kind of migrated over the course of the pandemic from the first way to the second. The first way to think of it is this is kind of how the way you were putting it, that these are like, you know, this are, think of these as individual failures. They're like, you know, these people who were trusted to do this, they didn't do what they should have done or whatever. But I also think we should start thinking more about like ways in which there was this kind of structural failure, um, ways in which uh, the kind of way that, you know, all of this stuff is kind of organized sort of creates an, I mean, you know, this is, this is a word that's your bread and butter in your field, like creates incentives, right, for uh, certain kinds of behavior because he, if you incentivize certain kinds of behavior, like then I, you know, I, I, this is the sort of the older I get, the more I just think this, right? You just can't expect people to behave well. It's just unreasonable. People, you know, it's the same thing you said about politicians, right? right. When people are incentivized to act a certain way, they will. And that's not even a claim about individual human behavior. 
because it might very well be that half the people aren't behaving that way. But if the incentive structures are bad, the people who behave well are the ones that kind of get marginalized or whatever. And we saw tons of that in the last two years, right? We saw tons of like, you know, perfectly well credentialed, um, smart people uh, raising criticisms about the party line about things and, you know, getting shut down on YouTube or having their Twitter feed closed or um, being subjected to, you know, being really censored in their universities. Yeah, being censored their universities are just being treated sort of viciously by um, people in public or whatever. Um, so I, you know, I think one could one could sort of think of this both ways, right? One can think of this in terms of um, like how 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 could individuals have behaved better? But I also I I do think that we just have a there's something something went wrong something went very deeply structurally wrong with uh, the way we kind of incentivized um, people to inform us in this. Um, it, went, it went badly. Did you get any pushback in your institution? In my institution, no, but, 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 but lots, um, but lots uh, in, my, you know, in my sort of professional community. My institution, I don't think, has any idea what I do, so. Um, <laughs> That's, that's good. good. Yeah. <laughs> that's interesting. Um, all right, so let, let's let's turn to, to climate science. Just uh, yeah. focus on on decisions we have to make now. And you know, in some ways, we can think about this as, as a similar problem. Where we sit here, we know there's climate change. It's just not a debatable thing, yeah. um, and that's that's always true, right? That that, that phrase is pissing me off also because like, great uh, climate change is like, we know that. Now, if you talk about the specific effects of carbon emissions in the climate, that's what we really are worried about. So, right. given our our societal arrangements these days, the amount of, of carbon dioxide that, that we expend, uh, that, that we emit in the atmosphere has an impact on climate, sure. We have models that tells us, make projections about what will happen under different scenarios of that concentration. There's lots of uncertainty about that. Um, all right, so we have here now, again, politicians and scientists, and you describe the scientists at least being a little bit more humble about, okay, here's what we know, here's what we don't know, here's the sensitivities, and there's been a lot of that. There's like a long standing literature on it. So there's, 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 there's a, a, a um, I guess the envelopes and, and uncertain bounds are better established there. But now into the politics, into the decision, the collective decision making part, part of this. Uh, so where are we and what, what do you think is the sort of, you know, what should politicians be doing and how they should be communicating what we know at this point? And it's a big question. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, I think look, here's I think something we know. I think this is, I think, I don't, I think this is robust to I think what we know is um it's inevitable that we have to change our energy systems. We just we can't, you know, we can't keep doing we can't keep doing what we're doing forever. Um, you know, I I think one could have arguments about at what point. You know, is it at, is it at 500 parts per million, or is it at 600 parts per million, or is it at a thousand parts? But you know, there's going to be a point where like we are going to have. There's a point where a we pass out, much. right? Yeah, there's a point where we there was a point where there's a point where where things are going to be bad, at least in parts of the world. Um, so you know, um, I think it's an look. Like, I think it's inevitable. I think it's a you know, it, it's it's just not the future. The, you know, the long term future. Uh, of our species on the planet is not going to be burning old dinosaurs. Uh, it's not sustainable. We can't do it forever. One could argue about how much longer we could do it. We could argue about how urgent it is to stop doing it. I don't think it's super debatable that we do eventually have to transition from it. Um, and, and we're not ready. We're not, we don't have, you know, I think some people think like, oh, we'll just, if we just put up enough solar panels and windmills, we'll be fine. It's not true, right? That's not true. We have, we have a lot, we have a lot of, you know, we either have to we either have to, you know, radically re-envision transmission and storage for those kinds of energy production, or we have to think, or we have to develop, you know, we have to better develop nuclear power, or, you know, we, 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 we need better technologies um, to transition to better energy systems in a way that isn't going to, um, you know, impoverish people who are already poor, or, and, and that isn't going to, you know, um, you know, put us... Um, Put us at the mercy of uh, some, you know, dictator in Russia that that sells us all of our natural gas or whatever, you know. Um, so, so we need we need technological innovation. Um, we might even want to be looking at technological innovation for climate repair. I know that's super controversial, but 
we might want to at least be looking at why, that. Why is it? Why, why, why do you think that's super controversial? I mean, uh, um, um, it's almost to me, it's almost like, it, you know, you, you, even if we stop emitting, it takes a long time for the carbon that's there to go away. Yeah. Uh, we need to know how to get it out, no? I mean, if we stopped emitting today, we'd be fine. Because um, if I understand things right, basically, basically, as soon as we stop, and if we you know, literally stopped emitting, um, temperatures stop rising for various, the, the various effects that kind of cancel each other out there. But as, as I understand it right, that, that's a reasonable assumption. But I mean, that's not going to happen. But that's not going to happen. Uh, I mean, that's that's not going to happen. We're not, you know, we, we, have, we have way too many power plants online. We have way too many. And let's be honest, right? I mean, I, this is kind of stuff I wouldn't have said 10 years ago, but I'm a little bit more whatever now. I, you get older, you get more. You know, there are powerful companies that own a lot of petroleum reserves. They're not just going to, you know, we got to be realistic about what, what policy options are out there. Um, so I think, you know, I, I think there's, there's, I'll give you the kind of, I'll give you the kind of the sympathetic take on it and the, and the more cynical take. The sympathetic take is, you know, people think it's not likely to work. They worry that, um, if you make it sound like it's going to work, um, it'll encourage people to be reckless. Um, the more cynical take is I think people don't, they, huh. We're being recorded. Um, you know, people people think that people think that what they're advocating is virtuous, um, and they they want it to be a Manichaean struggle, and they think that that's they think that that's a kind of compromise that isn't like isn't a kind of the kind of moral victory that they want. Um, I guess I'm I, losing I, patience I, I, for that. I'm losing patience for that. I mean. You know, uh, I, I'm, I'm a person that, that genuinely believes that, you know, on the horizon is a genuine potential growing crisis. And I think, you know, I don't really care. Like, I don't really care whether we, we get a moral victory against the evil petroleum industry. I mean, I just want to make sure that, like, people don't suffer. Um, I want to make sure that, like, we don't have, you know, we don't have a part of the planet become uninhabitable or, you know, not, not literally uninhabitable, but, you know, not be able to continue supporting the people that live there and have to have mass migrations or whatever. I, I'm, I'm down for anything that, that, that mitigates the risk of that. So I don't really care. Um, so let me understand, you know, let me understand the risk, the risk that you're worried about. Are those risks that you're worried about are risks associated with, um, climate events or uh, like, like, you know, hurricanes and things like that, or you're just thinking about, I think, about, it's well, mostly, no, I think the, the main thing to worry about is just um, heat and drought making, making um, crops, particularly in, partic I mean, particularly in the less developed parts of the world where people don't have um, a lot of flexibility about how they make their living. Uh, you know, um, they need the, they need the water supply. They need the particular water supply that they have. They need to be able to grow the particular crops that they're used to growing. Um, and there might be pretty narrow envelopes of like temperature and precipitation that they can do that in. Um, I think that's, that's at least the, that's the, you know, that's at least to me, the nearest term, like danger, uh, is just that, you know, you know, places like places like the middle East or whatever, where like water is not super, um, abundant, uh, you just are going to get po political upheaval when, a place like that goes through multiple years of drought. We've seen that. We've seen that, like in Chad. You know, I don't know whether I don't know whether it's fair or not to blame the uh, drying out of Lake Chad on climate change. A lot of people think it is. I, I'm not an expert on that, but um, it's pretty clear that the that the drying up of Lake Chad has not been a good thing. Right? It's led to a lot of violence and conflict. But, but let me ask you this: How yeah. do we help people in Chad and in the undeveloped parts of the world without more energy? It's it's one would argue that could argue that the yeah, only I mean, to get out of their poverty that's, state. Look, and that's why and that's why I think um, <clears throat> that's why I think our you know our absolute top priority ought to be looking for um, you know like have your cake and eat it like possibilities right we ought to be investigating in uh, we ought to be investigating every possible like source of energy that's that's carbon neutral and that absolutely positively includes nuclear power I, I just have diminishing patience for people that claim that they're concerned about climate change and are anti-nuclear, just losing patience with that entirely. Um, 
but, but it also probably ought to, it probably ought to involve like investigating climate repair. I don't, I don't, you know, yeah. And that, that, that when you say climate repair, you might say capture, but also some kind of oh, like yeah, engineer, capture, atmospheric think, engineering, engineering. Yeah. I mean, capture, I think is pretty uncontroversial, but it's like pretty, it's pretty, it's pretty sci-fi. I mean, we, we're talking about, we're talking about a lot of carbon. Uh, so, but yeah, I'm talking more about, we're talking more about the sort of, you know, more controversial, riskier things like, yeah, um, atmospheric, like, you know, aerosols or whatever that might reflect some sunlight back or whatever. Um, you, you wrote a paper, I was reading some of your work on, on like a more defensive geoengineering. That was like mm -hmm. along, along those lines, right? Is there, so the paper doesn't defend geoengineering because I don't think geoengineering itself is defensible right now. We don't know. But um, it's it's defending scientific research into you know yeah I think I just think that um, I think there there are lots of good reasons for doing the research. Uh, some that, of them are that yeah. So when you look at the portfolio of where we invest in in, in I guess of course there's pri private actors that we don't know, but when we look at let's say government spending and NSF grants and things like that and Department of Energy and so on. Um, do you have a sense of where the portfolio is right now in terms of, of the allocation of investment in basic research in what direction? And are we like kind of like spending too yeah, much? Yeah, I don't like, like it's, it's not really in my donor of expertise to, 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 to know at all what, what we're actually doing. Um, but I mean, I, I could definitely tell you a couple of things that I think we ought to be shifting to. Uh, I, I, I think we ought to be shifting a lot of resources towards new kinds of reactors, like, you know, um, thorium reactors that, that can't melt down. Um, There's this molten salt reactor. Right? Yeah, exactly. Same, same, right. same idea. Um, we ought to be, I think, you know, the amount of money we spend on investigating geoengineering is just like practically symbolic. I don't know why we're not, I don't know why we're not looking at that more. Um, we, you know, we, uh, we need, you know, we need to be thinking, trying to figure out like what to, I mean, some of the, some of the things that people like, like people that are interested in renewables, I don't think are quite as candid as they could be about, like I said, the storage and transmission requirements associated with that. Um, the transmission requirements, particularly like run up against like NIMBY problems. Nobody wants the like super high voltage DC wires, like running through their backyards or whatever. So we should be, you know, figuring out a way to cope with that. Um, I don't know, uh, but for sure we should be thinking more about, I think, innovation than we should be about like trying to get um, immediate changes in consumption, which we which which we know, right? Like you just, I mean, there's a there's a uh, there's a government in Germany right now that includes a coalition of the Green Party, and they just caught they just cut gasoline taxes yeah. because you know i mean these things aren't super optional right it's, it, you know it's, it's, it's easy to talk big about it but then you know uh winter comes and there's a war and whatever and people need their energy so all of a sudden even a even a even a government with a green party in it is cutting gasoline taxes so we we you know we, we need to have we need to have options i think that like don't require people to just be austere uh, with their energy consumption. I don't think that's going to be the long-term solution. And um, I worry about the ability to, for anything to be done in this direction, just because it seems to me that very similar to the pandemic, none of the actions were done uh, uh, through, the, through the sort of democratic process. All of it was done by sort of executive fiat and emergency orders and so on. I think if anybody had put up a vote in the legislature in Florida or Texas, like, oh, should we shut down? The answer would be no, they vote no. Should we close schools? The answer would be no. Should we, you know, have a mass mandate? The answer would be no. I think democratic process would turn it down. I think in the majority of places in the country, I think it kind of like, you know, to some extent, politicians react to incentives, and the governors did a little bit of that. But we didn't have a formal democratic process uh, pushing that. And a similar can be said for, you know, things associated with climate. The costs are so high in the types of ideas they are putting forward right now for people like, you know, gasoline at $10 a gallon would be very difficult for a lot of people in the country. And therefore politicians don't vote on things that right, might be right. gasoline $10 a gallon, right? Um, so the coordination process seems very hard. And let alone the fact that, you know, the US alone doesn't do anything. Europe alone doesn't do anything. China alone right. doesn't do anything. It, it, it's, it's really hard, the political economy of it 
seems very hard. And I think when you, when you talk about adaptation, I think that's the that's one thing we can do individually. We can you know, be investing on, on there will be things needed in the private market for people to adapt, uh, whatever, better walls in Florida, <laughs> better, you know, whatever right. it is, right? Uh, uh, and, and I don't know, I feel that that's the only really way forward is that we're going to have. Yeah, look, I mean, but this is, this is, this is sort of why, you know, when, when people ask me what I worry about, I don't really worry about the United States. I think we'll adapt fine. I worry about the impact in places right, where right. people can't afford to adapt. And then as far as the democratic thing, I mean, I guess, I guess I worry a little bit less about, um, uh, you know, democratic governance there when, if we're talking about say investment into technological development, I'm, I'm less concerned that something like that gets shoved down the public's throat than closing schools or, you know, um, closing houses of worship or whatever. I, I just don't think like, I don't think we could invest several billion dollars into thorium reactors, liquid salt reactors, and, and not everybody's gonna like it, but you know, um, most people are, not going to care that much, uh, and it could potentially, like you know, be there but, could but be a did, lot of work for it. But wouldn't you agree that that the democratic process is the reason why somehow, you know, we stop completely approving any kind of new reaction? We don't let research on that actually take place. We don't allow new ones to be built. Uh, we put a lot of red tape around the things that exist, which makes them incredibly expensive. Mm. So, and part of it is a reaction to a. Uh, an environmentalist movement, right? Absolutely. That decided that no, this is dangerous. This is going Absolutely. to make you know, yeah. whatever. They had these pictures, apocalyptic pictures from the fifties, and therefore, you know, we're going to stop. Um, it, it, it's it is a democratic process. I think that has stopped that 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 development. And I don't see any. I, I, I see um, unfortunately in that direction. I see zero movement on yeah on progress. And people. Um, are so I think I, you're coming at me different sides. And I thought so the first you were asking me like how can we make this accord with democratic process? And now you're asking me like, isn't the democratic process doomed? But look, yeah, look, I, I think, I think you know, I, I think environmentalists made a big mistake with nuclear power um, going all the way back to the late seventies, early eighties or whatever. Um, you know, you look at a place like France, France is one of the, France and Sweden are, Two of the only countries in the developed world that um, you know have a reasonable emissions profile, and they both rely on a lot of nuclear, nuclear power. Right. Um, is it South Korea so, also? Say again. South Korea. South America. Korea. That's right. Yeah, I was thinking. I was thinking. You know, just uh, North America and, and Europe. Yeah, South Korea also has a lot of nuclear power. Um, it strikes me that one easy solution would be to say tomorrow, pass a lot says, you know, we approve their reactors here. Let's build some here. Uh, oh yeah, uh, we, can make a lot of, we can make a lot of progress. We can make a lot of progress pretty quickly um, just by reforming uh, regulation of nuclear power. Um, look, I, this is this is not. I mean, I, this is not my domain of expertise, but that's my that's my. So of, let's, let's go sense. back then. Let's go yeah. back to the, to the climate models then. Uh, what are the challenges these days? What are the, the 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 things that you know? If you were to be critical about the stage of it, what are the things that are like? I was, I'm still in the middle of it. I'm reading um, Unsettled by, by what's his name? Kuhn, Steve Kuhn. He was the secretary of energy or something, science advisor for Obama. And, yeah. and you know, and I'm in the beginning of the book, so I don't have all the details yet. yet. But, but uh, what, what do you see as the sort of types of things that are unsettled in the climate science and the things that you know, we're not so sure about and the models have to be proved on and so on? Yeah, there's, look, there's a, there's a lot we don't. I mean, we don't know... Um, we don't, we, we have a pretty wide uncertainty envelope on a really basic fact. And that's what's the, you know, what's the, what's the multiplier between carbon and temperature, global average temperature. So in other words, you know, this is often encapsulated in a concept called equilibrium climate sensitivity, which is basically, if you think that pre-industrial carbon is 280, 280 parts per million, what happens if you double that and then wait? In other words, like get to 560 parts per million, stop emitting, hold it at 560, wait for the planet to reach equilibrium. How many degrees warmer is that gonna be? That's called ECS. Um, I think it, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, um, there's been a lot of circling in the wagon on that recently for some reason to try to argue that, that the, the range there is like 1.5 to four. 
But I, I don't, I don't really actually think those arguments are terrific. I think it, you know, it it's, could be 1.5 all the way past six for all we know. Um, but then, you know, then then there's a huge amount of uncertainty of like what the regional impact of that's going to be. Um, I think it's reasonable to think that you know you're stirring the pot. You're just going to cause you're going to cause regional changes. You're going to cause changes to you're going to make places obviously warmer on average, but you're going to make some places colder, and you're going to make some places warmer more than the average, and you're going to move precipitation around. Um, and uh, it's I think pretty hard to predict um, which of those are going to be mitigable, mitigable, and which aren't. Um, and the models you know, are then, not. They're not that specific. So when yeah, when... They, you know, they, they give you hints. They give you hints, but I, I'd be I'd be loath to say that they that you could. I'd, I'd be loath to say that I could tell you, uh, you know, let's say we get to, uh, you know, six hundred parts per million in fifty years. Like, what's the climate of Texas going to look like? I don't think I don't think it's safe to say that we can do that. Um, and then uh, you know, and then and then. What people really want to be able to figure out is like what's going to be the economic damage of this so you hear people talking about like you know gdp loss uh as a result of x y or z like admit forget it like that's i, I use i use that number a lot in one of my classes yeah i, I mean i just think that's a joke um like <laughs> i mean there's so there's so many unknowns in that right first first you have first you just have to get that first fact. You have to figure out what ECS is. Okay. Then you have to figure out like how that's gonna like, then you have to figure out how much that's gonna go, uh, what that's gonna do regionally, right? Then you have to figure out, um, then you have to figure out what that's gonna do to the economic development of each one of these places with, without knowing, right? Like how people are gonna react to that. Like, will they move? Will they come on? I mean, that's Right, I, that's just crazy. Uh, I don't think we can forecast GDP loss from in a hundred years. Million. That's right, in a hundred years. That's right. We, I mean, right? Who, who, who could possibly? If you'd ask them to predict what the economy of the United States would be like in 2020, back in 1920, do you think that anybody would have said, "Yeah, I think the top six, you know, market capitalized public companies in the United States will." all be sending in various forms bits of data around right no nobody would have thought that so nobody would have envisioned like where in some sense like a huge chunk of our economy comes from but you want them to be able to predict like what a change in the temperature is going to do to this unknown economic activity that you can't even imagine yet i don't know Maybe it, it seems like a real hard question. I mean, yeah. uh, that, that's a, that's a, and, and one that I don't see an enormous amount of research. I mean, if I name the top 100 economists in the country right now, yeah. I don't think any of no, them. No, I mean, the, the, met, the sort of accepted method is, I think, almost laughably bad, right? They, what they tend to do is they look at like, they'll go to Texas and they'll, they'll look at like, if I go from county A to county C and regionally the temperature goes up by one degree, and economic development slopes off by that amount. That's going to be my that's going to be my formula for like temperature to GDP. But that's not getting a like I mean no right I bet that's okay. I, that's almost self refuting that line of thinking. So yeah the 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 um, so and that's. So okay, so 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 you mentioned the the what isn't it one of the things that uh, uh, there's a lot of us. I guess it goes to the to the equilibrium model that we're talking about. Is it basically the idea of like how much cloud formation is going to be? Oh yeah, so that's I mean right. So that number I was telling you about the uh, equilibrium client sensitivity um, that comes from the so it, there's a very simple formula, right? There's a very simple formula that could tell you um, uh, what the how much the plant would warm under certain carbon scenarios if it were just like just the first order effects. Okay. But um, there are all these simple feedbacks, right? So various things as the plant gets warmer, various things happen. Um, water vapor increases, that's a huge positive feedback. That's pretty easy to estimate. That about sort of doubles the effect. 
Um, but then some of that water vapor turns into clouds. Some clouds are warming, some clouds are cooling. So there's both positive feedbacks and negative feedbacks there. That's probably the hardest one. There's also, of course, like ice melts. Ice is reflective of sunlight. So ice melting is another positive feedback. Uh, there's something called the lapse rate, which is basically the rate at which temperature cools. You know, as you climb a mountain, it gets colder and colder. Mm -hmm. that, that lapse rate can change as the planet warms. And for complicated reasons, the lapse rate is also like a source of feedback. So basically, right, if, you, if you're trying to figure out what ECS is, you're starting from like a pretty known, like simple value, like what would be ECS if there were no feedbacks? But then you're trying to estimate what all these feedbacks are. And yeah, the absolutely hardest part of that is cloud formation because, um, but, you know, when I said early in the, in the podcast, when I said that climate models are different than that they're sort of grounded in physics, unfortunately, the cloud formation is not really grounded in physics at all because clouds are like cloud particles are tiny. Clouds themselves are, you know, relatively small compared to the grid cells of a, of a climate model. So, so all the climate form, all the cloud formation stuff is, is, is highly sort of parameterized. And then it's, then it's, it's not that different. I mean, it's not quite as bad as, but it's not that different than Neil Ferguson making up like what the contact rate's going to be if you close schools. Yeah. So um, a lot of the data for these models that feed in to these models in terms of, uh, not data, I'm going to say like the path for carbon, for example, right? <clears throat> We know that looking backwards in time, we know our concentration of carbon going back to the beginning of the 20th century, more or less, right? Is that mm -hmm. fair to say? Even before with measurements of like ice cores, which might are erratic, they're not so easy to get, right? Um, so my question is, what's the, what is the state of out of sample validation of these models? If I go back and run the model from, let's say, you know, beginning the, the, the 1900 and mm -hmm. let it run a hundred years. And then you know, we know what happened to carbon in the period. Um, does that give us a, a, a some better clues about impact and yeah? So there's two so things on. going on there, right? There, yeah. I, there's there's the kind of there's like running the model against like kind of what we have, which are fairly detailed measurements from let's say going back to about 1880. Obviously, the quality improves from 1880 until today. Um, but that's that's basically right. You know, 1880 is sort of what we would call the pre-industrial period, that's about 280 parts per million, doesn't really go up that much until about 1950. We don't really change the atmosphere that much until about 1950. Um, and then we're just looking at, you know, then we're just looking at it going from 280 to whatever we are now, 411 or something like that, right? Um, but, you know, first of all, we're only at 411. We're not at 600, which is maybe what we're worried about. And we also haven't, we've only been at 411 for two or three years, like three years ago, we were at 410 and three years before that we were at 409, whatever. So we haven't waited to see. So, there's, so, so you then, then you can kind of maybe think, well, okay, but you know, um, maybe, you know, in some previous glacial period, there was less carbon dioxide, there was more, but yeah, there the problem is like the data is not great. Um, the situation isn't exactly analogous to what we'd be facing because it wasn't, it wasn't, didn't emerge in the same kind of mechanism that it'd be emerging here. So out of sample validation is super hard. Um, and that's why um, that's why you want to be looking at, like say for example, if you're if you know that like cloud formation is, you know, more like say school closure than it is like physics, uh, you want to be looking at like how sensitive is it to like different assumptions about cloud formation and you if you're being honest, you ought to be like giving a candid assessment of what the uncertainty is as a result of that. Um, and, you know, I mean, we, scientists are humans, sometimes they do better, sometimes they do less well, but I think, uh, I think we have, you know, decent, decent appraisals of what we do and don't know there. Let's wrap up here with maybe something positive. Uh, um, yeah. So when we look at the emissions of of the US and Europe to the major industrial parts of the world, um, they are either stabilizing or declining in the past right. 20 years. Is that correct? That's right. That seems right. And, yeah. and Europe, uh, I think, is stabilized. US, maybe we're, we're, we have some room to decline still because we're a little behind. Yeah. But what we have, we're both to Europe decline and stabilize now, and we're still declining a little bit. We're still on the decline. We'll, we'll probably start stabilizing soon, unfortunately. Right, yeah. Right. 
which which maybe still there's some room for us here improving. I guess the the we're still translating from from let's say co there's some coal plants that have been shut right. down and, and natural gas taking over and there's a decline that happens as a result of that, right? right. Um, all right. So so in some ways uh, that's a very positive development already that these two major developed parts of the world are are, are going down. Um, I think China and India still go up quite a bit, right? Mm -hmm. Those are the two major, major, major contributors. And of course, you know, as Africa develops, it will Hopefully. be absolutely. We want, we want, we want that to happen in Africa, right? Right. You're, we want, you're the sort sure. of person that wants, that thinks you should mitigate climate change by preventing economic development in Africa. I want no association with you. That's right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so, but I guess, I guess, my question is, given the you know, it's not, I think it's, a, it's probably not the case that Africa is going to go through a period of building a bunch of coal power, uh, coal power plants. Well, so their, their enrichment. I mean, they process, are in India. The India, both India and, I mean, India especially is building a lot of coal plants. China is too, right? China is less, but also quite a bit. Yeah. So, um, I mean, that's, that's why in a way, right, I think in some sense, the, the best thing that developed economies can be doing is rather than really you know, focusing on like what our actual emissions pathway is. Because as you say, there's like Europe in particular, you're trying to get blood out of the stone at this point, right? But if you look at like, you know, if you look at say, um, you know, to say something positive about, about Europe and particularly let's say Germany, one of the sort of amazing things that Germany did was that they massively subsidized certain kinds of, um, you know, renewable energy uh, and that enabled that technology to then become quite a bit less, um, you know, ha have quite a bit less of a markup compared to, to fossil fuels. So, uh, you know, that's the, I think that's the kind of thing we ought to be thinking about. We ought to be thinking about um, how can we be creating an environment where uh, we're developing technologies that the developing world could hopefully have available to them uh, to allow their economic development to proceed without having to just, you know, bring it all online with coal. Because, you know, that's not, that's, coal's not really great for you anyway, right. irrespective of climate change. It's not, we don't really, you know, I mean, China has huge pollution problems. We don't want, you don't want India to become like that. You don't want, so, you know, um, that's why I kind of, I just, I'm, I just, uh, I, I just despair at the, like the anti-nuclear side of environmentalism i think it's a terrible if we're building a, a bunch of nuclear power yeah. plants and, and we don't have a lot of there's a lot of plenty of fuel right available uh, that's my understanding oh i mean the, right. the the liquid salt the liquid salt reactors that you're talking about they would literally run on nuclear waste there's there's tons of thorium in existing nuclear waste so i mean the the the, the main reason we don't if i understand this right and i'm not expert on this but the main reason we don't have those is because of like worries about um security they they apparently you know they produce a high quantity of the kind of materials that in principle terrorists might want to get their hands on or whatever oh wow i mean i think that's pretty dumb myself but i don't know <laughs> i'm not a you know somebody i'm sure i'm gonna get hate mail for that because <laughs> but uh but that's that's you know that's the, as i understand it that's one of the main impediments to uh, those kinds of reactors is that they, they, they're considered to create a security risk. Well, that's your guess. How much of, you know, it seems to be one of those things that uh, as a transition, right, it's, it's highly important here. And, and you see that in Europe right now that, that they, by not having natural gas from Russia, they might need to go back to some coal plants and that's yeah. not going to be great, right? That's not good. Um, um, th there's, a, there's, a, there's a dichotomy of, of, of like the rhetoric against the, Fossil fuel industry is very strong uh, when thinking about from from you know certain corners of the world, right? Uh, and yet it seems that nothing can be done really without using quite a bit of natural gas in the next, let's say, almost fifty years, probably. Yeah, I'm like, and it's better than it's certainly better than coal. But again, I just think I think if we're thinking about the long term, I don't think that's a, I don't think that's ultimately. Um, I don't, you know, I, I'm not a geologist either. I, I, I don't know how much of that we have. Like, how long can that go on before those reserves are depleted? I don't know. 
Um, that's not I, something it seems that since I was a kid, it seems that it's going to end, and then they keep finding ways. Yeah, to that's, find fair more. <laughs> that's fair enough. I mean, that, like, and nobody who's predicted sort of peak oil has has turned out to be right. That seems right. right. But um, it's you know, it's not. It's 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 uh, it's better for emissions than coal. It's better than than oil, but it's not great. Uh, we can do better. Um, we we can be, I think, developing technologies that are better. Uh, that doesn't mean that in the short run, it's, you know, I think like, you know, the, uh, people understand this, people in Germany have like, begun to understand this, especially recently, that it's like not, it's not, it's not really an option right now to be entirely in renewables. So yeah, you know, natural gas is going to be used in the meantime, but I do think like we ought to be thinking in the long run about being able to transition away from carbon as a, as an energy source. I think it's, you know, it's, it's a, it's a problem like we I, again that's just what i said at the beginning we can we can have lots of arguments about how soon that's going to happen how urgent it is um i think there's uncertainty there i don't really think there's uncertainty about the fact that it's not it can't be the it can't be the end game the forever solution right yeah eric thank you so much thanks for being part of policy mccombs yeah thanks for having me